Scottish Church history, we're going to look at 1643 to about 1653. And uh, it's very important today. We're going to finish with the Psalm League and Covenant. We just have a few things to say. And then we're going to go all the way to the resolution or protester uh, controversy, the first split in the Scottish Church, which is extremely uh, important to know about and learn about. So let me begin uh, with Roman numeral number three. We show with the same sincerity, reality, and constancy in our several avocations endeavor with our estates and lives mutually to preserve the rights and privileges of the parliaments and the liberties of the kingdoms and to preserve and defend the king's majesty's person and authority in the preservation and defense of the true religion and liberties of the kingdoms that the world may bear witness with our consciousness of our loyalty that we have no thoughts or intentions to diminish his majesty's just powers and greatness. So in Roman numeral three, it's made clear that the signers of the covenant are loyal to lawful civil, civil magistrate, not civil magistrate in general, but lawful civil magistrate, lawful civil government, and have no intention of being disloyal to those who preserve and defend the true religion. The king is to retain all of his just and lawful powers. But this is not an acceptance of the divine right of kings, which where the kings can do anything they want. When King Henry had Anne Boleyn murdered, she was a Protestant, she was a good person, and she didn't do anything wrong. He had her head cut off on false charges. King Henry believed to the, the, the he believed that whatever he wanted, God wanted. And that's, that's the divine right of kings taken to the extreme example. Here's number four. We shall also, with all faithfulness, endeavor the discovery of all such as have been or shall be incendiaries, malignants, or evil instruments by hindering the reformation of religion, dividing the king from his people, or one of the kingdoms from another, or making any faction or parties amongst the people contrary to this league and covenant, that they may be brought to public trial and receive condign punishment as the degree of their offenses shall require or deserve, or the supreme judiciaries are both kingdoms respectively, or others having power from them for that effect shall judge convenient. Roman numeral four involves a commitment to support the covenant by seeking to discover those who are attempting to overthrow the covenant. It's negative. Reformation involves things that are unpleasant and negative, and that is identifying and punishing sins that are crimes and dealing with sins ecclesiastically that are unrepented of, that it involves that. Remember that to attempt to overthrow the covenant is an attempt to bring harm to the true reform religion and its lawful representatives. Men are to be punished in line to what their offense merits according to the law. And as we noted, this is fully in keeping with the biblical law where only those who are publicly seeking to overthrow the true religion are to be punished. If you're setting up an idol, if you're teaching people to worship idols, if you're teaching people to practice popery, uh, if you're encouraging people to celebrate Christmas and so forth, you need to be punished. If you're celebrating Christmas and it's public, you need to be punished. Uh, civil sanctions when appropriate, ecclesiastical sanctions when appropriate. Therefore, this means that if we're faithful to the covenants, anybody who's celebrating Christmas, we should bring them up on charges and they should be barred from the Lord's Supper if they refuse to repent of celebrating Christmas. You say, well, that's radical. That's unbelievable. But that's what it teaches. And is it biblical? And the question is, yes, it is biblical. This is, of course, contrary to Romanism and prelacy, where men and women are tortured to attempt to get a confession because there is no real objective evidence. The Bible requires two witnesses to an act of advocating a false religion and working to overthrow the true religion. So there's no status thought police here. You don't go breaking down doors and torturing people trying to get a confession out of them. If they commit a sin that is a crime, they're to be dealt with accordingly. Or if they commit a sin and they refuse to repent, they're to be dealt with accordingly. And that means witnesses, Matthew 18 and Deuteronomy. Roman numeral five. And whereas the happiness of a blessed peace between these kingdoms, denied in former times to our progenitors, is by good providence of God granted unto us, and hath been lately concluded and settled by both parliaments, we shall each one of us, according to our place and interest, endeavor that they may remain conjoined in firm peace and union to all posterity, and that justice may be done upon the willful opposers thereof in manner expressed in the precedent article. So Roman number five simply notes that we should, according to our own place, work to maintain the peace established between the two kingdoms, achieve in God's providence and remain in a solid peace and union to all posterity. And then the Psalm League and Covenant, and these things are very simple and they're biblical. The Psalm League and Covenant ends with Roman numeral six. We shall also, according to our place, places and callings in this common cause of 
religion, liberty, and peace of the kingdoms, assist and defend all those who enter into this league and covenant in the maintaining and punishing, pursuing thereof, and shall not suffer ourselves directly or indirectly by whatsoever combination, persuasion, or terror to be divided and withdrawn from this blessed union in conjunction, whether to make defection to be contrary, the contrary part or to give ourselves to a detestable indifference or neutrality in this cause, which so much concerning the glory of God, the good of the kingdom and honor of the king, but shall all the days of our lives zealously and constantly continue therein against all opposition and promote the same according to our power against all lets and impediments whatsoever and what we are not able ourselves to suppress or overcome. We shall reveal and make known that it be timely prevented or removed. All which we shall do in, as in the sight of God. And, because, and here's, here comes the confession. And because these kingdoms are guilty of many sins and provocations against God and his son Jesus Christ, as is too manifest by our present distresses and dangers, the fruits thereof we profess and declare before God and the world, our unfeigned desire to be humbled for our own sins and the sins of these kingdoms, especially that we have not as we ought value the inestimable benefit of the gospel, that we have not labored for the purity and power thereof, and that we have not endeavored to receive Christ in our hearts nor to walk worthy of him in our lives, which are the causes of other sins and transgressions so much abounding amongst ourselves, and our true and unfeigned purpose, desire, and endeavor for ourselves and all others under our power and charge, both in public and in private, in all duties we owe to God and man, to amend our lives, and each one to go before another in the example of a real reformation, that the Lord may turn away his wrath and heavy indignation and establish these churches and kingdoms in truth and peace. Okay, when is the last time you heard of a, a synod or a general assembly confessing sins? We, the General Assembly, or the Synod of this particular, particular church, do confess our sins of allowing people to celebrate Christmas and sing uninspired hymns. We confess our sins of allowing our college to teach perverted, heretical doctrines of creationism. We condemn and confess our sins of allowing people to deny justification by faith. You don't hear that today. It shows the difference between then and now. Continuing, in this covenant we make in the presence of Almighty God, the searcher of all hearts, with a true intention to perform the same as we shall answer at the great day, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, most humbly beseeching the Lord to strengthen us by his Holy Spirit for this end, and to bless our desires and proceedings with such success as may be deliverance and safety to his people and encouragement to other Christian churches groaning under and in danger of the yoke of anti-Christian tyranny, to join in the same or like association and covenant to the glory of God, the enlargement of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and the peace and tranquility of Christian kingdoms and commonwealths. So, in this final point, there is a commitment to maintain the covenant, to work for the unity that it establishes, to avoid any defections from the covenant, okay, to maintain the attainments of the Reformation, in other words, to make sure that we do not remain indifferent or neutral to what it teaches and requires, Whatever your opinion is regarding the binding nature of the covenant on the United States, and I believe it's binding, uh, but even if you don't believe that, it was adopted by the General Assembly twice, and it's most certainly still binding on all Presbyterians. This means that we should learn it and keep it to the best of our ability. Now, is that wrong? No. It teaches what the Bible teaches. It should be something brought up when questioning potential ruling elders and ministers. Are you against anything in the covenant? I mean, these are things that are taught in Scripture. Do you celebrate Christmas and Easter? Do you have uninspired hymns? Are you tolerating defections and advocating prelatical worship? These are legitimate questions that ought to, be, ought to be asked by presbyteries. And if they're not asked, then they can't, they're covenant breakers, they're not covenant keepers. They're unfaithful to the covenant. And you say, well, I don't believe in covenanting. Well, it doesn't matter whether you believe in covenanting or not. These things are taught by Scripture. You're unfaithful to Scripture. Well, there may not be a lot we can do about the situation in Scotland or England. We should be seeking to implement the teachings here to the United States or Canada, and especially in our own congregations. We should be working to uh, extirpate superstition and will worship 
from our congregations, from our presbyteries, from our synods. We should do everything we can to maintain the attainment of the attainments of the Reformation. So if the president of your seminary celebrates Christmas, he should be what? Told to repent or be fired. If your college teachers, for example, Geneva College or Covenant College are teaching Arminianism or dispensationalism or popery or prelacy, they should be fired if they don't repent. As long as Presbyterians are committed to loose subscriptionism, doctrinal pluralism, and maintaining current declensions, or the status quo, covenanting will remain unpopular. You'll notice, not only is covenanting unpopular, but it used to be a very common practice. Every year, the General Assembly of Scotland, and, and, and after that, the covenanters, they would declare sins. What have we done this year where we failed? What did we do that was wrong? Where could we improve? Sins of omission, sins of commission. They don't do that anymore. And if you read, like, for example, the, the official history of the OPC, they, they smooth out and they cover over all their sins. You get, you get a uh, propaganda version of history, not the true history. But we have to be willing to admit our sins. We're all rotten, filthy sinners. We need to admit them and repent of them. Remember, the covenant does not add anything to Scripture. The things in it are already moral obligations of Scripture. You can't add anything to Scripture. You can only require what Scripture requires, and that's what the covenant does. Now, one of the criticisms of the application of the Psalm League and Covenant in Scotland was that coercion came to be used. And I think Scott uh, Voss's comments on this are noteworthy. Here's what he says. <coughs> Quote, in 1644, the General Assembly enacted all, that all ministers take notice of any persons disaffected to the Psalm League to the National Covenant, that's 1638, or the Psalm League and Covenant, who should come within the bounds of their parishes so that these persons could be reported to the presbyteries or other ecclesiastical judicial judicatories. When Charles I surrendered to the Scottish army in 1646, he declared his disapprobation of the Psalm League and Covenant. Regulations were promoted, prom, promo, promulgated in Scotland by which large numbers of people were required to sign or give their approval of the document. In 1651, the Reverend James Guthrie stated that one of the causes of the Lord's wrath against Scotland was the ignorance and want of sincerity on part of many in taking the covenants. Many did take the National Covenant, an example of others, it being counted praiseworthy and commendable. After such a defection as was, as was then in the land, to engage in such a duty, to be reckoned amongst the repairs of the breach, many to take the Psalm League and Covenant, for fear because the refusing of it was attended both with ecclesiastical and civil censures. And therefore they, they would rather choose to hazard on the oath of God than to run these hazards amongst men which does not yet condemn the enjoining or taking of these covenants upon a good and warrantable principle. In taking of both covenants, though there were many whom a principle of the fear and love of God did move, yet there were not a few whom after discoveries had been made manifest who were acting thereto by carnal wisdom and policy for the attaining their base and corrupt ends, such as riches, places of preferment and livelihood and ease, end of quote. Guthrie listed as one of the special sins of the ministers of Scotland, superficial admitting to all, of all to the covenants, and solemn acknowledgement without taking sufficient pains to instruct and inform them in the knowledge of the things contained therein. This testimony of Guthrie that many took the covenants as a mere formality, or at best with an implicit faith, is not difficult to, to believe when we realize that such subscription was required of students entering colleges, of all persons for the first time receiving the Lord's Supper, as well as as of special classes of persons. The Scotch later urged Charles II to sign the covenants when at least some of them were sure he was playing the hypocrite. The leaders of Scottish Presbyterianism had not yet learned that subscription of a religious covenant to be honest must be voluntary and not the result of external pressure of any kind. Now, I noted when we discussed 1638 that they, there was measures taken to make sure people were sincere. Guthrie justified the infliction of both ecclesiastical and civil censures on those who refused to take the Psalm League and Covenant. And yet he counted it a cause of the Lord's wrath that so many took the covenants insincerely or from wrong motives. It seems strange that neither he nor apparently anyone else at the time could see that when refusal to take the covenants was attended with civil censures, it would require extraordinary force of character and incorruptible honesty to refuse to take the covenant. 
It is difficult to avoid the conclusion that the Parliament of Scotland and the General Assembly unintentionally tempted many to accept the covenants in a dishonest, careless, or at least implicit way. Of course, Scotland professed to be a reformed nation. And certainly such nation has the right by its own voluntary act to make a religious test essential to the holding of public office under its constitution. But when, for example, none could enter into an institution of higher learning as a student without accepting the covenant, it must be concluded that the zeal of the covenanter leaders exceeded their wisdom and that they placed a strong temptation to dishonesty or implicit belief in the pathway of mind in this land. Now, <clears throat> It's debatable whether you can require it to go to college, but you can certainly require it to be in the military, to serve on juries, to vote, and to be a citizen. You can't require it under, uh, uh, you know, if you refuse to take it, you're arrested unless you're working against it publicly. But there was nothing wrong with them requiring this. I agree that covenants must be voluntary. When a covenant is 100% biblical, and this is, the state has a right to require subscription for holding civil office, voting, serving on juries, being in the military, being a judge, or teaching in a school. Every, and this is Rush Dooney, I'm paraphrasing Rush Dooney, every constitution and law order is an expression of religion or a particular world and life view. Everyone is. Somebody says, well, I believe that... Uh, uh, not baking a cake for a homosexual is, is wrong and should be punished by the state. And you say, well, why? And then they're going to tell you their religion, their worldview behind that. There's a worldview behind every decision. If voting and holding office and serving as a judge is not limited by your covenant or constitution to those who accept true Bible-believing Christianity, then you have deliberately or at least implicitly given the atheist, the secular humanist, the sodomite, the heathen, an open door to removing Christianity as the foundation of society and replacing it with paganism. There is no neutrality. What they did in Scotland was ne necessary. It was biblical, and to not do it would be extreme foolishness and would bring their own destruction. Now, the United States, because of the deficiencies of our Constitution and declension, has permitted the overthrow of Christianity as the worldview basis of our culture. And we're seeing that, that today. Hillary Clinton should be arrested. She should not be allowed to serve. People who advocate homosexuality publicly Sodomites, lesbians, and all these kind of feminists, they should be arrested. They should not be allowed to teach or serve on juries or serve in the government. Well, now let's look at the engagement of 1648. <clears throat> the engagement of 1648. We're just covering the very crucial events. In 1648, we see cracks in the unity of the covenant, which is, which is what was called the engagement. <clears throat> at this time, Charles I was the prisoner of parliament, the English parliament. The Scottish, however, were still loyal to the king and were willing to help him as long as they did not have to violate the covenant. The most prominent loyalist in Scotland at this time was the Duke of Hamilton. In late 1647, a number of noblemen went to the Isle of Wight at the Carlsbrook Castle, where he was being held prisoner and made a secret treaty to help the king regain the crown. The crown. This involved an agreement to raise an army in an attempt to force the issue and put the king on the throne. Hamilton was the ringleader. The king agreed to support the Psalm League Covenant by having it sanctioned by Parliament. He also agreed to implement Presbyterian Church government in his dominions for three years. Now, that, that ought to be a red flag right away. Why not forever? For three years. After the three years, the form of church government would be determined by an assembly of ministers with 20 commissioners appointed by the king himself. Now, you see the lying and dishonesty here. It's already been determined. Why does it have to be redetermined? The fact that only three years were stated and the king could nominate 20 of the commissioners should have been a red flag. It's obvious he's not sincere. The king was clearly insincere. The king also promised to suppress schism and heresy. This treaty between certain Scottish noblemen and Charles I was called the engagement. Hamilton and these noblemen 
are called by historians the engagers. 1648, the engagement, the engagers. When the terms of the, this engagement became known in Scotland during a meeting of Parliament in March 1648, a vehement disunity and struggle followed. And here's what Hetherington says. And here, this will lead to the, dis, the disunity in the 1650s between the protesters and the, <clears throat> the less faithful. Quote, the covenant, covenanters perceived at once that the engagement involved a violation of their most solemn vows. The commission of the church immediately met and deliberated what steps ought to be taken in this new crisis. They did not deliberate long. They felt the deep power of the covenant upon their souls too mighty for any earthly condensation to shake, consideration to shake. And accordingly, they framed a declaration pointing out the sinfulness of, of an engagement, which involved direct perjury and must be drawn down the divine displeasure on both church and state. But the purely political or royalist party had obtained the ascendancy in the parliament and the earnest remonstrances of the sincere covenanters were disregarded. The arguments of the ministers confirming those of the nobility who regarded religion as of, of more importance than any earthly consideration and brought back some whom political and personal motives had led astray, amongst whom was Earl of Ledoon, but the majority held on to their course and determined to fulfill the engagement to the utmost of their power. The assembly met at Edinburgh on the 12th of July and made choice of George Gillespie to be moderator. They not only approved of the declaration and other similar writings of the commission, but passed an act condemnatory of that act and declaration of the parliament, which enjoined all subjects to subscribe a bond equivalent to an oath in support of the engagement. They further published a declaration and exhortation to all members of the Church of Scotland, pointing out the unlawfulness of the engagement and warning against dangers in which it would certainly involve the church and nation. An able answer was also written to the Committee of Estates, proving by scriptural arguments that the engagement was inconsistent with safety and security of religion. And, as the Hamiltonian faction was well aware of the power which the church had recently put forth when it raised the kingdom like one man for the defense of civil religious liberty, they employed every artifice to bring as many ministers as possible to their side. By that means, either procure support or to neutralize opposition. To meet this dangerous decisive policy, the assembly passed an act censuring those ministers who either favor the engagement openly or abstain from pointing out its sinfulness and warning their people against entertaining its bond. A respectful but firm supplication was also written to his majesty showing this insufficiency of the concessions pr promised him by the engagement and its positive sinfulness as tending to dissolve the kingdom and, its, in per, kingdom and perjury and imploring him to comply with the covenant and thereby enable him with a safe conscience to give him that support which your sincere loyalty and affection promoted them to bestow so far as their duty to God would permit. From this time forward, Scotland presented a melancholy contrast to the ten preceding years in which strict adherence to the covenant had given it union and strength irresistible. It was now divided into three contending parties. First, the sincere covenanters, led in Parliament by Argyle and Ladoon, and in the church by Rutherford and Gillespie. Second, the framers of the engagement, led by Hamilton, Lenark, and Lauderdale, who wished to take an intermediate position and who were joined by a considerable number of ministers, of whom Bailey was the most respectable. The third party was headed by Trancar and Callender, and was composed chiefly of those who were determined royalists of the Cavalier caste and paid little respect to either oaths or treaties, provided they could get their purposes accomplished. The two latter parties were easily induced to coalesce, and their junction gave them a decided preponderance in the political councils of the nation. That the genuine covenanters could not unite with such men will excite neither wonder nor surprise in the minds of those who are able to appreciate their principles. And that the chiefs of the engagement should attempt to overwhelm them by invectives and try to represent them as seditious and fanatical is only what was to be expected. But that men can yet be found to repeat such slanderous comedies might appear incredible were it not a matter of daily occurrence. And that still happens today. We use, uh, if you would take a course at a modern Presbyterian seminary, the covenanters are presented often as deluded fanatics. The Scots, in favor of the engagement, raised an army which went into England to fight to place the king on the throne. They suffered a great defeat by Cromwell and his forces who were, fooled, who were not fooled by the king's lies at all. Cromwell uh, would have his head eventually. 
The leaders of the Scottish forces uh, were defeated. Uh, Hamilton was arrested. He was captured, arrested, and then hanged. The engagement, which was unbiblical and contrary to the Solemn League and Covenant, and of course the Covenant of 1638, was a complete failure. It was wicked, and it drove a wedge of division between what had been, to this point, the unbroken ranks of the Covenanters. And that takes us to the act of classes. So you're going to go from bad to worse here. One of the effects of the failure of the engagement was that the strict Covenanters took control of the Parliament, which formerly was controlled by engagers. The strict Covenanters communicated with Cromwell and convinced him that they were opposed to the engagement. This, at least for the present, averted a war between Scotland and England, or we should say Scotland and Cromwell, who really was controlling England. <clears throat> Because the strict covenanters believed the engagement was unbiblical and contrary to the covenant, they took steps to cleanse the state of such dangerous compromisers. This was done by the Parliament passing the Act of Classes on January the 4th, 1649. This act declared all engagers ineligible for public office. Now, that's totally biblical what they did. We should learn from what they did that was right. That was totally biblical. It also set classes of ineligibility according to the degree and of their offense. The army was purged of everyone who had taken part in the engagement or who were opposed to the covenants. These men were identified as malignants. That's where the term malignants comes. The word malignant means they were rebelling against God and are having a negative spiritual effect on the nation. And they're doing so by opposing the covenants. Modern historians have viewed such laws as intolerant and uncharitable. But we must keep in mind that A, the covenants were recently agreed to, and such compromises are egregious. B, of course, they're biblical covenants. B, it was a time of great danger when prelatists were chomping at the bit and were ready to persecute the covenanters. And C, such laws were needed to preserve the covenants and the safety of the nation as a whole. Remember, there's no neutrality. If you, if you do what they did in the United States and say, well, you can, you can be a president if you're an atheist or a Muslim or, or whatever, we can't have uh, religion intruding into the federal sphere. Well, when the secular humanists take over and start persecuting Christians, you have yourself to blame, don't you? Those who were opposed to the cause of God and truth due to adhering to errors, ignorance, and unbiblical pragmatism needed to be kept out of positions of authority. Scotland was an explicitly reformed Presbyterian nation. They had achieved an incredible level of reformation. It is reasonable and biblical to seek to maintain these religious attainments using civil laws. It is simply the biblical philosophy of the Great Commission and the Christian civil government. That's all it is. A Christian civil government and Christian law order cannot maintain itself in a wicked world where non-Christians hate Christ and his kingdom. If laws are set up to keep pagans, atheists, and heretics uh, and make them allowed to vote and hold office and serve on juries in the military. Christians who teach complete freedom of religion, where the state treats Satanists, Hindus, and Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, Scientologists, Muslims, Romanists, and Bible-believing Christians exactly the same, have virtually guaranteed the takeover of the United States by the heathen. The rejection of biblical law and the persecution of Christians. An atheistic law order cannot coexist with a biblical law order. And there's evidence. Now, I haven't had the time to look at it in depth, but there's evidence that high-ranking officials and even Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton are Satanists. There's evidence for that. Now, I have to look at it too. Uh, and that wouldn't surprise me one bit. Now, if they're not explicitly Satanists, they're implicitly Satanists by their policies. They're Molech worshipers. That place where Clinton would take would uh, go with his buddy who was into incest on that island in the Caribbean. They have a temple. They have a temple there. It's like a, a, a mimic of an Egyptian temple with a statue of Molech on the top, and they have sex orgies with underage kids in there. So it tells you what the Clintons are like, allegedly. An atheistic law order cannot coexist with a biblical law order. They can't coexist. One will win. 
You can't, they can't coexist. I'm telling you, they cannot coexist. <clears throat> you remember when they got rid of the Ten Commandments from the courthouse a while back? Well, do you know what, why they got rid of it? The Satanists created a statue of Satan, you know, the goat. And they presented that, well, if they're going to have the Ten Commandments, we get to have a statue of Satan in front of the courthouse. And the courthouse responded to that, well, just get rid of the Ten Commandments. Because they couldn't take sides. They had a choice, God and the Ten Commandments or Satan. And they couldn't take a side because of the Constitution. So they got rid of the Ten Commandments. Moves to enthrone Charles II, 1650. The attempts of the royalists or engagers in Scotland to put Charles I on the throne by force hastened his miserable end. He was put to death by orders of the English Parliament in 1649. Cromwell insisted. He was beheaded. And I think he deserved it. I have no problem with that. The royalists in Scotland were still dedicated to placing a king on the throne. Therefore, in 1650, the Scottish Parliament sent a commission to confer with Charles II on his views regarding the covenant. He's over in the Netherlands. With negotiations going well for the royalists, Charles sailed from the Netherlands to, for Scotland. He was permitted to land on June the 16th, 1650, after he, had been after he had subscribed on the boat to the Psalm League and Covenant. It should be noted that most of those from Scotland who accompanied Charles back to Scotland were men who had been excluded from positions of public responsibility due, due to the active classes. So the people that were helping him come back were pretty rotten people. Not, not all of them, I mean, not all of them, but most of them. Those who knew that Charles II and his friends knew of his loose, licentious habits. There was very strong evidence that Charles would say or do anything to be placed on the throne. In August, they signed a declaration of he signed a declaration of adherence to the Psalm League and Covenant, which contained an explicit renouncement of popery and prelacy. Charles knew that the strict covenanters did not trust him as being sincere. Therefore, he deliberately did things that he believed would change their mind. We know from subsequent events that Charles really hated the Psalm League and Covenant and was dedicated to prelacy. Now, if somebody sins once and they say, I, re I repent, you can take that at face value. But if somebody's habitually doing something and working against something for years and years, and they all of a sudden say, I repent, you can demand fruits for meat for repentance for something that's been habitually done for years. Paul didn't, after Paul was called by Jesus Christ in the desert, he didn't immediately become an apostle. He was trained in the desert for three and a half years. So a general assembly met after his arrival in 1650, and all the ministers who had worked with the royalists, such as Montrose, were deposed from the ministry. The landing of Charles II in Scotland caused Cromwell to march towards Scotland, for he would not tolerate a steward who was an enemy of the Commonwealth on the throne of Scotland. The basic problem at this time was while a number of Presbyterians were strongly opposed to Charles II, the majority were willing to take his word on his acceptance of the covenants, even without any evidence of sincerity. Okay, they're violating a biblical principle there. Like I said, it's one, if, you know, if somebody commits a sin and they repent, that you can take that at face value, but if somebody is doing something year after year after year after year, and they're hanging out, like Charles, they're hanging out with people who are licentious and fornicating and doing all these crazy things, you have no reason to believe they're sincere. They have to prove it. And they didn't require that of Charles. This was a form of pragmatism that contradicted Scripture. When somebody has been guilty of habitual scandalous behavior for a long period, they can be required to bring forth fruits of repentance before being trusted, especially when we know that their friends are wicked. This is simply biblical wisdom. And here Hetherington explains the situation well. The explanation of the whole matter may be briefly stated. There were then, as there has always been, two great parties of public men. The one composed of those who judge and act according to principle, the other of those who are guided by expediency. The first, led by Patrick Gillespie, uh, George had died, Patrick Gillespie's younger brother, Guthrie, Samuel Rutherford, 
and Warriston were anxious not to press the king to the subscription of the covenant until they should have some evidence that he was in a state of mind as might render it in him, indeed, a religious act corresponding to the nature of the solemn obligation which it involved. Till that time, they were perfectly willing that he should be their king, but should remain as such as possible aloof from all intercourse with profane and irreligious men. The other party thought it inexpedient to be so strict. They considered it enough if the king should subscribe the covenant literally without uh, however little his mind might be in accord with its spirit. Not apparently perceiving that this act would be an act of profane impiety to which they could not hope the blessing of God to be given. Their worldly prudence or pragmatism suggested to them the absolute necessity of a complete national union. To resist the formidable invasion of the dreaded Cromwell, but they failed to perceive that a union, not of principle, but of compromise, can never be firm and permanent. They were willing to tamper with the sacredness of an oath in order to frame a political bond. And by this unhallowed exp expedient, they forfeited the protection of him, in capital letters, whose covenant they thus profaned. They ought to have remembered that the covenant of 1638, which had provoked an ark of safety in, not a, in a not less stormy sea of troubles, was sacredly guarded as far as possible from being subscribed by any of those whose purity of character and devotion to the cause suspicious suspicions were entertained. The one party, in short, viewed all political and national transactions through the clear medium of religion and therefore saw them in their true character and aspect. The other viewed religion itself through the turbid and warped medium of political expediency and therefore saw neither religion nor politics in their true nature bearing value and in reciprocal influences. It may be that the strictly religious party were too rigidly severe, but unquestionably their error was immeasurably less than that of those who, following the suggestions of a short-sighted human policy, urged upon the king an oath, which for him to take was perjury in the very act, and the inevitable consequences of which were an impious mockery of heaven and the putting of power into the hands of men by whom it was certain to be abused. They had every right to ask for sincerity. We turn to 1651 to 1660. The Church of Scotland under the Commonwealth. After the English Parliament discovered that the Scots had received Charles II, they prepared to invade Scotland. Cromwell, after studying the Book of Psalms, decided to lead the invading party. He was confident that he was doing the Lord's will and that the Lord would bring him victory. The army of consisting of 16,000 soldiers came into Scotland on July the 22nd, 1650. While they marched, a sizable fleet of English ships sailed along the coast of Scotland. The invaders were met by the Scottish troops on September the 3rd, 1650 at Dunbar. The invaders were on their way straight to Edinburgh. Cromwell achieved a decisive victory and took 4,000 prisoners back to England. They were mistreated by the English, and many of them died of disease on their march south. Of the 4,000, only 1,400 of them survived their imprisonment. By the 7th of September, Cromwell's army captured Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. The routed and shattered remnant of the army regrouped and rallied at Stirling as Cromwell advanced through the countryside, conquering as he moved. This is what led to the controversy between the resolutioners and the protesters, 1650 to 1653. And this is extremely important in Scottish church history. Because of the dire situation militarily, Charles II and the Royalists sought to modify or rescind the Act of Classis in order to unify opposing parties in Scotland and beef up the military. Remember, you couldn't serve in the military if you didn't strictly subscribe the covenant. They wanted to be able to admit to the army those who, had, who by the act had been declared incapable of public service. This would repair the severe damage done to the army at Dunbar, in their mind, and would help them defeat Cromwell. So let's compromise. Let's be pragmatic. Let's rescind this strict act and allow everybody into the military. The difficulty of this plan was to obtain this consent of the church. The church had excommunicated many malignants, the covenants forbade such pragmatic compromises. And the law of the land was that no excommunicated person could serve in public office. That's totally biblical. The excommunicated had to be uh, had rescinded before the plan of the royalists could come into being. So they had to get the church to compromise in order for the political plan to come into being. As this is going on, keep in mind that the Scottish Parliament had already crowned Charles II king of 
Scotland on January the 1st, 1651. Given the uh, incredible crisis, uh, excuse me, given the incredible evils conducted by this king against Christ's church, it is worth noting the oath that he took when he was coronated. Listen to this. This is, this is the oath he took. Quote, I, Charles, king of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, do assent and declare by my solemn oath in the presence of Almighty God, the searcher of hearts, my allowance and approbation of the national covenant and of the solemn league and covenant above written and faithfully oblige myself to prosecute the ends thereof in my station and calling and that I for myself and successor shall consent and agree to all acts of parliament and joining national covenant and solemn league and covenant and fully establishing Presbyterian government, Presbyterian government, the directory for worship, confession of faith, catechisms, in the Kingdom of Scotland, as they are proven by the General Assemblies of this Kirk and Parliaments of this Kingdom. Okay, that's the whole Westminster Standards. And that I shall give my royal assent to acts or ordinances of Parliament passed or to be passed and joining the same in my dominions, my other dominions. And that I shall observe these in my own practice and family and shall never make opposition to any of these or endeavor any change thereof. Could it be any more clear? Now a man who could take such an oath, and then order copies of the covenant to be burned, which he did, uh, by, the, by the hangman, and order those who adhere to the covenants to be tried for treason and murder several people, certainly holds a high rank among the great perjurers of history. There's a special place in hell for Charles II. A total liar, a total wicked man. The covenanter should be much more cautious. The crisis that developed occurred because the political sphere, which was compromised and corrupt, had a declining effect on many in the church. This would lead to the repeal of the Act of Classes in 1561 and a split between the faithful strict covenanters and the pragmatic unfaithful party. Here's what Voss says. After Cromwell's capture of Edinburgh in 1650, King Charles II and the Royalists in Scotland determined to seek a more united support by the different parties in the church and nation. The outcome of his determination was a proposal known as the Public Resolutions. The States of Parliament consulted the General Assembly whether some way could be not found by which those persons who had been disqualified by the Act of Classes could be restored to positions in the state and in the army. The General Assembly held in July 1651, passed the resolutions, and declared that, quote, in this case of so great and ardent necessity, we cannot be against the raising of all offensible persons in the land, that is armed forces, and permitting them to fight <coughs> permitting them to fight against this enemy for defense of the kingdom, excepting such as are excommunicated, forfeited, profane, flag flagitious, etc. End of quote. The ardent necessity to which the assembly referred was the defeat of the Scottish army by Cromwell at the Battle of Dunbar and the subsequent capture of Edinburgh. From July 1651 on, the Covenanters were divided into we should say Presbyterians, I'd, I'd say the protesters were not acting as, uh, I mean, the, the resolutioners, in my opinion, were not faithful covenanters at all. The covenanters were divided into resolutioners and protesters. Those who favored the pu pu public resolutions were called resolutioners, and those who opposed them were called protesters. Because they protested against the legality of the General Assembly, which had ratified the public resolutions. The leaders of the protesters were James Guthrie, Patrick Gillespie, Johnston of Warriston and Samuel Rutherford. Even before the adoption of the resolutions in September 1650, these men published a short de declaration and warning. And uh, other books I have say that it was probably written by Patrick Gillespie and they approved of it. In which they called the land to national repentance and especially called upon the king to repent for his sins. And especially to consider whether he had not been guilty of hypocritical acceptance of the covenants in order to obtain the crown. In later times, it has been common to represent the controversy between the resolutioners and protesters as a quarrel over trifles, an utterly unnecessary division of the forces of Presbyterianism. History has shown, however, that the protesters were right and the resolutioners were wrong. Many of the persons admitted to power under the public resolutions became persecutors of Presbyterianism after 1660. If the protesters that is the strict covenanters, had been able to control affairs, Scotland might have spared, been spared 28 years of terrible persecution under the bloody and perjured Stuarts. 
The question involved in the controversy was whether it was proper under existing circumstances to repeal the Act of Classes. The General Assembly approved of such a repeal, but with certain restrictions concerning the excommunicated profane, etc. When this approval had been granted by the General Assembly, the Parliament repealed the Act of Classes entirely, taking no notice of the exceptions reserved by the Assembly. This opened the way for a flood of ungodly men and open enemies of the Covenant of Reformation to receive places of responsibility in the government and the army. It is clear that the resolutioners and the protesters differed from each other not only in the specific matter of the propriety of the repeal of the Act of Classes, but in their whole view of the principles and ethics of Christian civil government. The protesters viewed the calamities of the nation as the consequences of national sin. In their view, the remedy lay in repentance, confession of sin, and a new obedience to the divine law. That is to say, they looked on the situation from a spiritual viewpoint, and they were sure that not carnal, but spiritual remedies must be used if real relief was to be had. Along with this, they maintained the Christian ethical principle that it is never right to do evil that good may come. That the end cannot justify the means. And that circumstances can never justify sin. And they apply these principles not merely to individual and ecclesiastical life, but to their life of the nation as such. They would obey God, put their trust in God, and leave the issue with God. The resolutioners, on the other hand, looked upon the national calamities as a result of a lack of unity in the nation. In their view, the remedy lay in healing the breaches caused by the act of classes and rallying all the people of Scotland to the defense of the king and the kingdom, regardless of differences in religion and of past conduct. They looked at the situation from a worldly viewpoint and wished to apply mechanical rather than spiritual remedies. They appear to have felt that whatever might be the abstract right or wrong of the thing, the national emergency justified overlooking such considerations and taking all possible measures against the enemy. It may be said, too, that most of the really earnest Christians of Scotland were numbered in the ranks of the protesters. Hetherington says that the writings of the protesters are thoroughly pervaded by a spirit of fervent piety and contain principles of the loftiest order stated in language of great force and even dignity, of which we find but few similar instances in the productions of the resolutioners. End of quote. The controversy between the two parties continued for a long time. In 1652, the protesters had held a general assembly, and after their adjournment, the resolutioners held an assembly, at which representatives of the protesters appeared and handed it out in a protest signed by 63 ministers and 80 laymen, which declared the resolutioner general assembly to be unlawful, unfree, and unjust. The Resolutioner Assembly threatened to censure the protesters, but the latter obtained the protection from the Commonwealth. In 1653, the two parties held general assemblies at the same time in the same building. In other words, two separate general assemblies in St. Giles Cathedral, Edinburgh, with a partition between them. This is the first split in the Church of Scotland. And so you hear people say, well, it's not, it's not, we can't split over perversions in worship. We can't split over uh, denials of the doctrine of creation. We can't split over perversions of the justification by faith. We have to hold together. We can't split. We can't split. Well, that's not how the original covenanters felt. This is the first split. And I think Hetherington's analysis of what occurred is excellent. He, said, he writes this. Before quitting the subject of the resolutioners and protesters, there is one point to which it is desirable that reader, the reader's attention should be directed. It will be remembered that the direct topic which caused the contest between the two parties was the question respecting the propriety of repealing the act of classes and admitting men of all professions and religion and all varieties of character into the army and to other places of power and influence in a time of such danger. This, the political expediency party resolved to do. And against this, the strict covenanters protested. It is evident that the difference of opinion between them arose from the different positions from which they viewed the same subject. Both were fully aware of the peril, perilous state of the nation and of the necessity of adopting some strong measure to meet the emergency. But the one party trusted chiefly in a combination of human strength, though obtained by a sacrifice of religious principle. The other, in the confession and abandonment of past errors, the restoration and more strict enforcement of religious purity, and that calm trust in the protection and strength of God under which, by such procedure, they hoped to place their cause. The one party regarded national division to be the main cause of the nation's weakness. The other ascribed their calamities to the prevalence of national sins, especially to the violation of the national covenant, which consisted in entrusting its enemies with power to do it injury. 
It is needless for shallow thinkers to imagine they can decide the question sum summarily by terming the one-party men of enlightenment and liberal sentiments and the other narrow-minded and intolerant bigots. And that's the way most modern people view the covenanters, the, the strict covenanters. The covenanters had seen the storm of war borne back innocuous from their mountain bulwarks but a few years before when not a man was allowed to take up arms in a sacred cause of religion who was not believed to be a person under its influence. They had besides the analogy of all scriptural history in their favor, so that the views they held appeared to have the sanction of recent facts and the word of God. And had their opponents been as truly patriotic as they pretended, instead of seeking political influence before they would lend their aid, might they not have formed themselves into a separate army? hung on the enemy's flanks and rear and distracted his attention, cut off from his cut off his supplies and thereby promoted in the most liberal and unselfish manner and to the utmost of their power to rescue their country from the strong invader. This would have entitled them to the honorable appellation of men of truly enlightenment minds and genuine patriotism, enlightened minds and genuine patriotism. But their whole conduct then and subsequently proved them to have been influenced chiefly by ambition, selfish and despotic principles. History repeats itself. And modern Presbyterians, most of them, have not learned from history. They teach history in the seminaries, but they don't learn from history. Having noted the resolution or Protestant or conflict, I want you to be aware, warned that most modern theonomists and most, the vast majority of modern Presbyterians fall into the resolutionary category. They're traitors to the covenant. They're traitors to the attainments of the Reformation. Not in everything, but in many things. Pragmatism doesn't work because it brings down the covenantal wrath of God upon a nation. Covenant keeping is what works, not compromising is what works. And then we have a, just a brief analysis for current application. A biblical analysis of the protester resolutionary conflict is crucial for understanding how not to seek Christian dominion in a society, how not to achieve the, the uh, Great Commission. Some who are ignorant of church history will say that covenanting did not work and following the Bible so strictly cannot work in such a sinful world. Therefore, they argue that we must be much more pragmatic. We must be willing to compromise. We must not be so dogmatic. We must be more pluralistic and willing to work with Roman Catholics and conservative atheists and unbelieving libertarians, etc. And I'll never forget Andrew Sandlin, this is like 16 years ago, published an article you know, we, we can't hold to the Westminster standards. That's too strict. It's too exclusive. What we need to do is achieve a union of Christians by going back to the first seven ecumenical councils. You can include Episcopalians then. You can include Charismatics. You can include uh, uh, the Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox. You can recruit Roman Catholics, etc. The problem is, is a lot of those people don't even, you can include Arminians. They don't believe in the biblical doctrine of salvation. They don't believe in justification by faith alone. And if you think you're going to have blessing by that kind of a compromise, you're crazy. You're wrong. Implicitly or explicitly, they believe that pragmatism and compromise is the key to long-term success in making Christian America a Christian nation, or at least a moral nation. And they would also say that we must ignore the first table of the law, for Christians are very divided on worship and the Sabbath, and such laws are too controversial. And even some theonomists have a very sophisticated argument as to why the first table of the law doesn't apply to society today. Total nonsense unbiblical trash. But what really happened in Scotland that led to persecution and tyranny was a rejection of the recent covenants in favor of pragmatism. If they had kept the covenant, Charles II would have never been put on the throne. Pragmatism reveals a lack of faith in God's loving providence, a lack of faith in God's willingness to bestow covenant blessings for being faithful in trying circumstances. It's hard to trust God when things are going bad. It's hard to not be pragmatic at times. But pragmatism doesn't work. We have to learn this from church history. One must be faithful to scripture and not compromise, even when from a human standpoint, pragmatism looks better in the short run. You know, oh, you look at how bad Hillary Clinton is. She's, she's, she's satanic to the very core. Ethically, she's really little better than Adolf Hitler. But you say, oh, that's horrible. How could you say that? Well, abortion has murdered over 50 million babies in the United States alone. So don't tell me that these people aren't wicked. 
History has revealed that pragmatism has always been a disaster in the long run. So you tell the libertarians, the atheists, the Arminians, the Romanists, forget it, no voting, no serving in government until you subscribe to the covenant. We also learned from this conflict that although the Scottish church at that time was far more reformed and consistent than most modern Presbyterian churches today, they were not infallible or perfect by any means and had serious problems. We must learn from what they did right and from what they did wrong. And there was the faithful party, let us not forget. The protesters were the faithful party. Historically, a look at Presbyterianism reveals that even uh, when there is a small group of committed strict biblicists who are willing to fight for what is right, there is usually a much more larger group of men that are mushy, pragmatic, and undependable. We see this in the protester resolutioner, for resolutioner conflict, and we see this in the controversy over modernism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Machen and his close allies were a very small, dedicated minority. Most of the church officers, even ones deemed fundamentalists, thought Machen was a fanatical fool that was trying to be true strict at the expense of the peace of the church. And those people who were fundamentalists, they sided with the liberals and they destroyed the PCUSA completely. It's apostate now. The mushy, pragmatic middle allowed the liberals to win. So let us learn from history. There can be no compromise. There must be an insistence on keeping the covenants of our forefathers that are lawful, that are biblical. We have to keep them. And when you compromise them and you join NAPARC and you compromise them and you allow everybody to celebrate Christmas and you compromise them and you, you have a college where they're teaching that six-day creationism is for idiots and uh, they believe they have six different views of creation and you have a uh, vast majority of teachers are Arminians and heretics, you're not keeping the covenant. You're not requiring the covenant. You're being pragmatic. That's not the way to go. So let us learn from that. We'll continue this next week. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for our forefathers. Lord, illuminate our minds to understand your, the history of the church from your perspective, that we would be faithful to these lawful covenants, which we are obliged to keep, that we would learn from the mistakes of our forefathers, and that we would not be compromisers, we would not be pragmatists, we'd be biblicists all the way, even if people hate us and malign us and gossip about us and trash us. Let us be faithful, Lord. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen.